Hey everybody, and welcome to Learning from Smart People. I am your host, Rob Oliver, and I want to just say thank you so much for being here with me today and for being a part of this journey on the Learning from Smart People podcast. I am excited today to bring you another smart person. Her name is Sandra Younger. She lost her home, 12 neighbors, and nearly her own life in a catastrophic California wildfire. Since telling her story in a widely acclaimed book, The Fire Outside My Window, she has become an international speaker and media guest sharing resilience building principles that transform disaster into opportunity. Sandra, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for inviting me, Rob. I'm delighted to be here. Absolutely. So here's the really cool thing. I mean, when I read your story, I mean, not only is it a fascinating story, but that idea of turning disaster into opportunity, that's near and dear to my heart. So can you just kind of tell me the story about what happened, what happened with the fire? How did, you know, what's the backstory there? The backstory is that, gosh, 18 years ago already, so we're coming up on 20 years, my husband and I decided to move um, to the country. We had raised our kids in the suburbs of San Diego. They were off uh, doing their own thing, and we just wanted a little change. So we found this beautiful house in a beautiful location with a view down a canyon all the way to Mexico. Just spectacular. We bought this house. We loved it. We loved being so close to nature, owls, hawks, coyotes, bobcats, all sorts of critters around us. And um, we were just really in heaven. And then seven months after we moved there, we woke up to the sight of fire outside our windows. And we had to um, just abandon ship jumped in the car with our two giant Newfoundland dogs and um, Chelsea, the brainless cockatiel. I call her brainless because my husband, uh, she only loved my husband, but guess who fed her, Ah. right? So anyway, we saved her and um, we were driving through fire to, um, to get out of there. There was a little miraculous moment I think you'll appreciate. We got to a point where we were enveloped in smoke And we were coming down the side of the mountain. So this little tiny narrow road that was literally cut into the side of the mountain we lived on. And I couldn't see anything. And I started screaming to my husband, Bob, I can't see the road. And he said, you're just going to have to remember where it is. And I said, but I can't see it at all. And he says, just don't wreck the car. (laughs) And of course, what he meant was, he just meant, don't drive off the side. Right. That would be the end of it. And at that moment, Rob, we're lost in the smoke. And a bobcat jumps out of the brush by the side of the road, right in front of my headlight. And just sort of wobbled there for a second and then took off into the smoke. And something in me knew that he was on the road that I couldn't see. And something in me knew to follow him. So I followed the bobcat, and that is how my husband and I escaped this historic catastrophic wildfire. Wow. For 14 years, the biggest in Cali- in California history. Yeah. Wow. It, 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 so, so incredible. I mean, so devastating, so difficult. And, and yet, in the middle of it all, you're, here, you know, you're finding, you're finding your miracle of, we got out of this, and we really feel like we, we shouldn't have. And I mean, exactly. We should not have logically. Yeah. And I see so many parallels between your story and my own story and, and without getting into all of them, it's, it's a matter of, you know, you're going through an experience. This is not what you signed up for. And, not at all. and in the middle of it, you are, you're afraid that you're not going to make it. And then there comes that point where you you get through it, and now you're kind of you're on the other side, and you look back at it, and it really becomes a learning experience. Can you talk to me about some of the things that you've learned as a result of what you went through? Well, that's the exciting part because almost immediately after we literally 
hot footed through this curtain, this final curtain of flame out of the fire, um, I started to wonder about coming back. And I started to wonder if maybe there were some steps to coming back from adversity that other smart people had found before me. And I started looking for those. And at first I found Viktor Frankl. Right. Are you familiar with him? Yeah. Man's Search for Meaning. Yep. Um, Amazing man. Yes. Yeah, so was he Jonathan Livingston Siegel? No. Well, he might have been. Okay. But Viktor Frankl was um, an accomplished um, psychiatrist, I believe, okay. in, um, in Austria. And he and his family were caught up in the Holocaust. He lost his whole family. He uh, was imprisoned at some of the most notorious concentration camps, Dachau. Right. And, um, and he came out of that with this appreciation that the last of the human freedoms, as he called it, is the freedom to choose our own way, no matter our circumstances, that, that we have control over our attitude, even though, even when we have no control over our circumstances. So that's the first thing I learned was that that much I get to choose, yes? Yes. This is how, unfortunately, some of us have to learn it is through these dramatic events. And from there, I discovered this entire body of psychological research, which I know you must be familiar with, positive psychology, and a subset of that called resilience, and a subset of that called post-traumatic growth. So I distilled everything I could find on this um, into five principles or five practices that I believe help us build resilience like a muscle. So that was the first thing I learned. I learned that I could choose whether to be a victim or a survivor. Right. And people were calling me a victim. You hear it all the time, disaster victims, right? Fire victims, right. accident victims. And in, in my experience, a neighbor of mine said it best that we buried the victims, mm. 12 of our neighbors who did not come out of the fire. And the rest of us are survivors. And it seems like such a small semantic difference, but it's vast in terms of feelings of empowerment versus disempowerment. Yeah, I, I so agree with you. And that applies to anyone who's been through any type of, uh, any type of difficult circumstance. There is the victim mentality of what happened to you. And um, there is the survivor mentality of this is what happened to me, but the the strength, the resilience is there. And let me highlight two words that you said. And sure. Um, at least I think there are two words, post-traumatic growth. Okay. Post-traumatic growth. Yes. We don't think of that. We think of post-traumatic stress, right? Right. Um, I, I was thoroughly expecting the word stress, but what I was, what I was thinking about is that there are so many things that are designed you're talking about a forest fire. You're talking about a fire in, in that covered a lot of land and burnt that. But there are things that are designed to grow specifically after a fire. So there are some trees that have seeds that don't germinate <laughs> until the fire passes. And, you, you know, it clears out some of the underbrush and it makes room for... But there are, there are things that grow specifically after a traumatic experience. And... And can you, can you talk to me more about, you've got these five principles, and I would love to hear more about those principles for growth and resilience. Yes, and, and we call those, those plants the fire followers. Okay. We got to see them when, um, when our canyon, our beautiful canyon, was reduced to a moonscape or a Marscape, now that we know what Mars looks like, except black instead of red. And there was nothing, there was not one green thing. And then we got to see it all come back, the resilience of mother nature. And that is why I say resilience is innate. Resilience is in our DNA because we are a part of nature, right? We are all a part of this big blue marble. So what I discovered first that really helped me the most um, was gratitude. So I have these five 
principles I call the comeback formula. And the first one is come to a place of gratitude. Be focused on what we still have instead of what we've lost. And it sounds Pollyanna-ish, but it's very, I, it's very powerful, isn't it? Yeah, you know. You hit it on the nose. Yes, yes. Um, I, okay, you're preaching to the choir, so I, amen, keep going. Amen, brother. <laughs> so, so we do know that from experience, but also from science, because... Um, and you mentioned to me, you have a master's in psychology. So, you know, the psychology is a science. There are very rigorous studies that have been conducted now that show gratitude as an antidote to pretty much every negative emotion. So if I can find one little thing that I'm grateful for, despite a world of hurt, it puts me on the path to healing and growth. And it doesn't have to be huge. It can be one little thing like, oh, the sun is shining today. I see blue sky outside, and that's beautiful. Of course, with me, the first step, and I'm sure with you too, Rob, I'm alive. Yes. I am alive. I had a friend who called me after the fire, and all she kept saying was, Sandra, you're alive. You're alive. So gratitude is the first and probably most important step right up there with choosing our label victim or survivor yeah all right so um you're talking about gratitude and you're talking about um understanding the power of choice and so um what other what other principles do you have here you because you've got five of them right or um i get five yep so what else can you share with me this is fantastic okay good so the other four um spell out the words the word back, come back. So come to a place of gratitude. B stands for two things, for being patient, because as you well know, you don't bounce back overnight Mm -hmm. from things like this. When I speak with disaster survivors, which I do frequently, I, I tell them, you know, it's okay to feel whatever you're feeling because recovery begins with tears. Right. Recovery begins with tears and we are naturally resilient and we can build our resilience, but we can't skip those steps in, in grief. You know, the, the tears are part of it. And yet the second B is believe you can come back because resilience is a natural part of who we are and we can build on those natural abilities. Just like we all have muscles and some of us have built them to different levels of, of, you know, proficiency sure. and awe right. in some cases. So we can build our inner strengths and our inner skills just like we can build our physical body. So that is the second tip is to um, be patient and yet believe that you can come back, just not overnight. Yeah. Let me just throw in there. One of the first guests that I had on the podcast was MJ Calloway, uh, who's a friend of mine from here in Pittsburgh. And she is a multiple time cancer survivor mm-hmm. and her, she wrote a book and her book is called bounce up. And I she, like that. She said yes. to bounce back, just gets you to where you were, but to bounce up takes you to a better place than you were when you started. And so what I'm hearing you talking about is that comeback trail, but you're, you're being patient. It's not, it's going to take a while. There's going to be tears, but there's also the belief that, you know, we can get through this, we can get back. And I, I would really push that concept to say, not only can we get back to where we were, but we can get back and be better. So I, yes, I love it. I totally agree. And in fact, <clears throat> I saw recently bounce forward. Okay. Um, and I thought maybe I should rethink the name of my <laughs> resilience formula because it's true. We do end up in a different place. I would not be talking with you now had I not been through that really soul-wrenching experience of losing my home, everything that I owned, except what was in my office or at the dry cleaners, and, and you know, almost losing my own life. It gave me a reason to write the book that I, as a journalist, I was a journalist um, for my career, 
um, had always wanted to write, you know, but I hadn't found a story that was compelling enough to stick with the long, talk about being patient, the long process of writing a book. And that book then gave me the platform to speak about these things. So I completely agree. And the, you know, the word survivor is only the first step in coming back. Survivors tend to become thrivers. Thrivers tend to become givers. They, they've gotten so much they want to give back, which is exactly what you're doing, Rob. And givers sometimes become changers. They change what needs to be changed in the world. We see this in the people we admire the most. We see it in Malala. We see it in Nelson Mandela. We see it in, you know, even Steve Jobs, who may not have been the nicest person, but was knocked down so many times and came back and truly changed the world. I'm talking to you on a Mac. And that is what we admire in people. But none of us want to go through the adversity that, that prompts that kind of post-traumatic growth. That is post-traumatic growth. Yeah. So survivor is just the start, that comeback of the comeback journey. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. And um, you are so right. That, I mean, surviving means that you're alive. And the beauty of that is as long as you have life, there is potential. And That's right. Um, which is amazing. Okay, so we've got um, come to a point of gratitude. We've got be patient. And believe, and which brings us to an A, if I'm not mistaken. You are right. So this is the toughest one. Accept help, ask when you need it. Mm. Accept the help that people offer you, ask when you need it. I speak with a lot of emergency professionals. Uh, before COVID, I was speaking at a lot of uh, conferences for firefighters and emergency managers who discovered my book. Um, and this is, and I talk to them about resilience because who has a more traumatic, stressful job than an emergency responder? And it gets to them. You know, right. they haven't traditionally been allowed to even admit that, but they love these resilience practices. So this is the toughest one for them: is to accept help. How do you call nine one one when you are nine one one, Rob? Mm. That's their dilemma. So I talk with them about that importance of accepting help and asking for it, being tough enough to ask when we need it is really important. Yeah. It's part of the hero's journey, which is this, um, this, this uh, prototype for how we come back from disasters. And part of that journey, which has been documented, is asking for help, accepting help, having a team, having a mentor, asking when we need it. And that is so hard. I didn't want to be the one who was needy. I was the one who was the giver. Right. And now people were coming to me with clothes, checks, dinners, all kinds of furniture, all kinds of stuff, because we had literally nothing left. Yeah. I, I was actually, tough, but critical. I was actually going to mention that my sister um, and her husband, just lost everything in a an apartment fire, oh, and no. and so I was gonna say that it like you don't realize, but it's everything. It's even the little like your kitchen. You accumulate all of the little gadgets in your kitchen to yes. open cans and to do all of the, and now all of that's gone, and you've got to start over. And yes, um, but there was something else that I wanted to kind of highlight about what you're saying, right? You're talking about asking for help. We are mm -hmm. taught to be independent. We're taught to like, you know, it, the American way is to do this on your own. It, you know, Frank Sinatra, you know, like, I did it my way. Right? I did it my way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and yet I was appreciating that none of us are truly self-made. All of us have people who have helped us to get to where we are. Absolutely. And, yes. And so for somebody like me dealing with my disability, I am, I kind of have to walk the balance that says, I want to do as much as I can for myself. And it's difficult for me when people step in to give me help that I, I don't need. But right. at the same- They assume. Yes. Mm -hmm. They assume you're a victim, Rob. Yeah. Um, and so you have that where like, I'm not going to accept help that I don't need. But I also have to realize that there are times when I need help and- asking for that, it's okay. Um, and, and it's necessary to 
to be able to move forward uh, and to be able to get through life. We all need help. And you can't, you can't truly be able to help others if you're not willing to accept help yourself. That's true. That's what Brene Brown has taught us, right? That if you want to be a giver, you've got to be a receiver. And you know what I try to point out to my emergency professionals is we are social creatures. You take one bee, that bee is not going to last very long. We are the same way. We are built to work in community. One of the things that we've found about resilience over 50 years now of studies is that the top thing that really helps us to come back or to come to bounce forward is connection with other people. And that's what this gets to really is we are not the lone wolf, right? We are built to be in a community. So when we ask for help, when we accept the help that's offered to us, instead of saying, oh no, I'm good. We are not being weak. We are playing to our strengths. Okay, I have to tell you a story. And okay, um, good. I love stories. This story is from uh, my second book. My first book was still walking. The second book is still falling. And in still falling, I share the story where I was going to my brother-in-law's house, who lives next door to us. We're in Pittsburgh. It's on a hill. And as I was going into his driveway, I the wheels on my wheelchair hit the curb. And I flipped my power wheelchair over in his driveway. Okay. Oh no. And so I'm laying there. I'm literally strapped into my chair, like laying face first on the ground. And I'm by myself. A woman drives by on the street and sees me and stops, rolls down her window and says, like, are you okay? Can I help you? And I told her, no, I'm good. Um, I think my family (laughs) saw me like, I'll be fine. And she says, okay. And she drives off. And afterwards I, th- I thought like, what a goober she is for like guy said he was okay. I mean, he's laying there upside down and, and, and what a goober I am for saying, uh, yeah, no, I'm good. Um, so d- to have her at least go to the door and say, Hey, can you guys come out? Cause I mean, the whole family was inside and eventually they did come out and help me, but it's that willingness to acknowledge our own need and, and to, to ask for help and to move forward. Um, I, when we come to see, I think we already touched on this one, but um, did. Uh, so we can, if you want to give me C and then we can move into um, yes. K. Well, C, we did touch on this because this is sort of fundamental. It just happens to come in the middle of the word back. But C is choose your story. Now, Viktor Frankl talked about choosing your attitude and I'm a storyteller. So I like to put everything in terms of, story, you know, the hero's journey um, that that documents our return to normalcy and beyond. I like to tell that story or that uh, that archetype of a story. So choosing your story means, am I going to be a victim? And some people, I know you've seen them, they really love being a victim. Mm -hmm. They really play that for all it's worth and then some, because then, oh, poor me, I need everybody's help. I need everybody's pity, right? They get to be passive. They get to um, abdicate responsibility. But most people don't do that. Most people choose the survivor's story. And we have already talked about where that story can lead from survivor to thriver to give her to changing things. You are changing the world's perspective of disabled people, see? And I'm hoping to, ex- to change the world's perspective on disaster victims because we're not victims. So this is what I mean by choose your story. Yeah, no, I, I love that. It is such a powerful reminder that it, not only, you know, as long as you're alive, you have potential, but as long as you're alive, you have choice. And you have a choice. And listen, I understand this because when you look at me, I, I would, you know, given the choice, I would choose to be able to walk rather than to use a power wheelchair. However, um, in that, uh, you also are able to choose the the perspective. And I, I, I'm sure I've mentioned this on the show before, but sometimes people talk about me as being confined to a wheelchair. And the fact is, yes, I can't get out of my wheelchair. However, my view is the opposite in which I am liberated by my wheelchair. 
without this wheelchair, I'm not getting out of bed and I'm, <laughs> I'm confined to bed. That's, you know, but this thing is what allows me to get out and to be part of that community. And as you talked about earlier, to, to form the relationships and, and to be a part of that social world that exists out there. And so right. it's all in how you, it's all in your own choices and how you choose to look at things and how you choose to look at yourself and, and what has happened with you. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so we, there were two B's, one A, one C, is there, is there a K as well? Or, um, did we get the two B's and, and we have it, have all of it? There is a K. Okay. Um, I used to call it kiss the past goodbye, but I think a more powerful story is keep moving forward. Mm. It's not going to be easy. That's, that's part of the being patient thing. But if we keep taking one little step at a time to celebrate every win, to celebrate every move forward, that is how we come back and move on. And that is uh, the, the part that moves past just coming back to where we were to having an opportunity now to explore new territory that would not have been open to us any other way. God, that is phenomenal because you, you get through that place where you're coming to a place of gratitude. You uh, got to be patient. You've got to believe. You've got to ask for help and accept help. You've got to um, choose where you, what you are, whether you're a victim, or, but then you've got to yeah. keep moving forward because how you know so many people that live in the past and they can, yes. it's all about what happened in the past and that's as far as they get and they're never, never able to move forward. But yeah, that, that's beautiful. I love this. This is, this has been a, a wonderful exercise. And I would say like, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but th <laughs> this, this isn't, it's not rocket science. I was going to, I'll tell you, I'm a dad and I make dad jokes. And so I get in trouble because I intentionally mess up common phrases. So I was just going to say, it's not rocket surgery, right? Um, it, <laughs> yes. it, but at the same time, it is elementary and it's foundational and it's fundamental in, in which all of us go through difficult circumstances. All of us have those rough times. And what you've done is you've given us a framework to say, yes, you were there, but you don't have to stay there. As your K says, you can keep moving forward. It's beautiful. All right. So Sandra, if people are looking to get a hold of you to get, uh, to find your book, uh, what can, where's the best place to do that? At my website, which is just my name, sandrayounger.com. And that's a great place to get in contact with me. I do coaching. I do um, workshops. I do um, keynotes. And they can get a free gift there, which is, can we see this now? Yep, is it beautiful. In Focus? The Comeback Formula Guidebook, which is available if you just scroll down to the second panel of my website. Um, complimentary copy that goes into depth on everything we've talked about here and then gives you a few practice exercises to put this into place in your own life, along with a few of the studies, the scientific studies in your field of psychology that, um, that prove these are sound principles. They may also want to get a copy of the book that I wrote about the fire, which is The Fire Outside My Window, and that's also available on my website and on Amazon. Beautiful. Thank you for letting me share that. Oh, absolutely. I will, I will put a link to it uh, put a link to your website. I'll also put a link to the, the book on Amazon so that folks can take advantage of yes. that and check out the book. Sandra, thank you so much for being on. We have come to the end of our interview, which means it's time for three questions to establish your humanity. Um, oh, no. Are you ready for this? I don't know. This would, should have been homework, Rob. Oh, oh no. See. I, if, I, I can't <laughs> tell you what the questions are because then, um, then it wouldn't be... A true, authentic okay. look. So who I'll is my best. who is your favorite author? Oh, wow. You know, I'm going to go with the classic Shakespeare. Okay. Um, because he understands the human condition, and he got it right centuries ago. He talks about everything. All right. Um, what is What is something your friends would say 
is so Sandra. So if there's one one thing, that they would say, you know what? That is just so Sandra. I tell stories. Sometimes I get a little too in depth and go on a little too long. So I, I tell stories. I see stories and everywhere, and I can't help but share them. You know, I would just give you credit. You and I are a kindred spirit because that's. <laughs> I tell stories, life, it, to me, stories express, you know, what people do and what people go through and the, the, the commonality, I, which me, yeah. I live in a world of analogy. I can't tell you what anything is, but I can tell you a story about exactly what it's like. <laughs> so, That's right. All right. So, um, if you're making spaghetti, the question is, is it homemade sauce that goes on the spaghetti or is it store-bought sauce that goes on the spaghetti? Can I have a third option? Absolutely. I don't cook. Oh, uh, you know what? That's even better. Um, it's it's ordered in Thank spaghetti. Goodness, my husband is an amazing cook because long ago I decided that you know the time I spent cooking was not reciprocated by the appreciation of my family. That's awesome. It used to be homemade. Then it was a jar, and now I. Uh, I am a very grateful recipient of my husband's cooking, and then I do the dishes. Uh, you know what? That's a it's a it's a symbiotic relationship in which, like you, <laughs> totally you, you do the prep, and I'll do the cleanup. So wonderful, Sandra Younger. Thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate you sharing your story and sharing the you know the framework for uh, your comeback formula. Check out her website. Check out her book. Um, for everybody, thank you for being here today. Thank you for listening. Uh, this has been another smart person that we have definitely learned from. I would encourage you to send me a note, hook, um, follow me on social media. It is at LFSP podcast, as in learning from smart people podcast. And I will remind you as always that when you stop learning, you stop living. Have a great day, everybody. 